This is WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. You are listening to One Human Nation with your host, Sandy Batiste. This program will be talking about race and race relations in your community and nationally. Our goal is to be open, honest, and productive. Welcome to the One Human Nation show. I'm your host, Sandy Batiste. And the purpose of this show is to provide a safe, honest, open, and productive environment so that we can learn and share in our stories about race in the United States. The viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. So thanks for tuning in, and we're going to talk about um, this explicit association test. I mentioned um, on last week's show that I was going to make a point of retaking the test that's associated with how... um, how it relates to race as far as black people and white people. If you've been to the website, onehumannation.info, this is where you can click on the link that will get you to the implicit association um, test website. And they have a variety of different types of tests that you can take um, because this show is related to race and racism in this country. I focus specifically on the ones that relate to that. So the last time I took this test was um, probably, I think, about a year ago when I was living in Austin, um, Texas. And so the demographics, and I've been in Austin for, oh, man, um, 30 years plus, and um, moved back to Savannah last year, around November or so. So when I took the test last year, what it is suggested at the time is that I had a slight preference, slight preference for African Americans over European Americans. And if you're asking, why should I care about my um, implicit association test score? It's intended to help predict behavior especially if you're in roles where you're um, in a position to hire for promotion, um, if you're in the medical treatment, uh, medical field, and decisions related to criminal justice. Remember, this show is all about looking at your internal culture. We try very hard to embrace um, an environment where you're not judging each other, it's about looking at your internal culture and what what are the things about your internal environment, how you grew up, what you were exposed to, um, and, and how does that relate to where you are today? It's not about judgment. And part of telling the story is making sure that when you're telling your story, you're using your I voice. And remember, they're, they're not any um, subject experts where we talk about, oh, in order to be on the One Human Nation show, you've got to be an expert in this particular area. We want everyone to feel comfortable in sharing their story. And one of the um, one of our communication agreements that we use in the One Human Race initiative, and these are a series of workshops um, that really get into the whole race conversation and the history of race in this country. And, and it it talks about how to take care of yourself and to stay engaged and to be aware of your reactions and your responses. And there's this wonderful part of this statement um, that was created by someone that was very involved in these workshops. And, and basically she said the, the divine can be found in the tension. So as you listen to the show today and as you listen to the stories, because we do have a guest speaker that's going to be coming on in about 15 minutes or so, it, it's really about, you know, taking a look at what what it's what did what was said 
that resonated with you, that spoke to you in a way that may have made you feel uncomfortable, may have made you feel tension, and may also prompt you to tell your story. And if you want to share your story, send me an email at my story at one human nation dot info. Again, that email address is my story at one human nation dot info. So getting back to the implicit association test, I just kind of want to give us a, a little reference point, a little background. So when I tell you what my results were, you won't go, oh, I should have known. So and again, if you did, It's not about judgment. It's really about figuring out where we are on our personal journey. So the results when I took this today was your data suggest a strong automatic preference for African-Americans over European-Americans. When I took this test last year, it basically said your data suggests a slight preference for African Americans over European Americans. Now you can make of that what you will, um, slight as opposed to strong preference now. Um, the demographics in Austin, totally different from Savannah. And when you take a look at this information, they'll also give you the percent of web respondents with each score. So it will tell you the strong automatic preference for European Americans compared to African American. There was a 24% preference, moderate automatic preference for European American compared to African American, 27%, slight automatic preference for European American compared to African American, 17%. Uh, And it goes, you know, kind of breaks everything down. So, for me, I, I'm not surprised. Um, I am African American. I, you know, I I had someone else take this test, and she's African American, and she didn't have a preference one way or the other. Um, uh, it, as far as what the implicit association test revealed, um, but again, it's your story. It's what. What does that say about you as far as um, do you have a preference if you're in positions where you have that authority to hire? Are you making some decisions based on an unconscious bias? And, And that's where we can run into trouble. It's when we don't realize that we have a bias um, and it turns out to be um, a negative. So I'll give you an example today of something that occurred um, this week, and it was reference to how we make decisions based on the sound of someone vo- someone's voice, based on determining can you identify over the phone whether that person um, was white or black. And it's not necessarily that you can even identify that from their name, because sometimes when you hear a name, and we've talked about that before on the show, you automatically make an assumption of what that person's ethnicity is. And sometimes that ha- it comes with an unconscious bias that you're going to say, oh, this person is X, Y, Z, and you're not going to um, engage with them. And for whatever reason and whatever you're doing, because of that preference. Well, what came up today was when I mentioned, or this week, when I mentioned to a young black male professional on, um, on, on the show, I said, well, you know, I host a show because of course now I tell everybody just so I can get the word out there and people can listen in, um, what it was about. And he says, oh, we were just talking about this at work. And I said, really? He said, yeah, we were talking about it at work. And I was mentioning to one of the gentlemen that works with him who happened to be white that his skin color did matter because he went on an appointment this week and he had been talking to the potential customer over the phone. But when he got to the door, they would not let him in because he was black. So this is this week. This is if you're if you're still living in that bubble and, you know, our truth is in our bubble. If you're still living in that bubble that, you know, well, all of that happened a long time ago. 
we're talking about this week in 2017. If you're still in that bubble, I mean, and you haven't looked at anything based on what's on the news or read the newspaper, uh, and it doesn't matter to me what your politics are. It's about being awake and aware. So I found that to be, you know, um, interesting that even as of this week, and I'm I'm not surprised. So, you know, I shared with him some of the, the same experiences that I have, you know, in, um, in Austin, uh, in, in reference to people not being able to tell over the phone, whether, you know, I was black or white, and then at the point of time where they needed to make that connection to actually do business, and I was a mortgage lender, they would make a decision uh, based on the color of my skin. And and it gets to be obvious when someone, um, it, I didn't have the door literally slammed in my face, but when you don't have um, your phone calls returned because somebody went to your website and then they saw that you were African American, the excuses that come out when you do follow up with them, because after a while, you just kind of get to that point of, okay, let me just see what story they're going to tell me, what, what's going to be the excuse of why they didn't complete their, their mortgage application or, or whatever it is. Now, it was obvious for this gentleman of what the reason was, because they just flat out refused to let him in. And they pretty much told him the reason why. So um, we're going to have a guest today that's going to be talking to you about some of their experiences based on, you know, where they grew up and the perception of where they grew up, some of their experiences, um, not only growing up, but also uh, we try to get the the full story, um, you know, at different times in someone's life based on what they're willing to share. Because again, this is about what that this what you feel comfortable in sharing. This is not a to to be a gotcha moment where I'm trying to, you know, trick you into saying something that's going to alienate you with your family or you don't get an invitation to the family reunion because of something you said on on the radio or or felt like you were tricked into saying it's it's about having a safe honest open and productive dialogue so we can all learn we can listen we can find the common denominator um, and sometimes in in the listening there is the tension there is the discomfort um I encourage you to take the implicit association test just to see, you know, what do you have an unconscious bias? Are you aware of um, an unconscious bias? There is another one on that website that I'm going to take. And hopefully I'll get it done before the um, show next week. And it's in reference to having a preference to the um, color of skin tone, whether light skin or dark skin, because that in itself is a whole nother um, issue as far as how we make um, decisions about people, uh, assumptions about people based on the color of their skin. How do you determine, um, you know, whether someone is black or white or if you, you know, trying to figure out what what bucket do we fit in? And I think some of that is just natural human behavior. The problem is if it if if it creates a negative impact on that person um, because you're making a negative just judgment based on a stereotype. So when we when you start thinking about your internal culture, I do encourage you to take a look at the website onehumannation.info. Posted there is the picture of the iceberg culture, and we encourage you to take a look at that to ta- um, to really come familiar with what's the external things that you see and, and make judgments about. And we do it all the time. It could be food, flags, festivals, holidays, fashion. Um, language, literature, dance, music. Um, and the guest today is going to talk about, you know, kind of some of their experience from a music perspective. Um, and then deep culture, what's underneath the iceberg, what's really driving that iceberg along. And, and it's everything from how we, our communication styles, um, our notions of things like courtesy and manners, our concepts of everything from um, self and time. And I think that's our caller calling in. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with One Human Nation.
Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. I grew up in the suburb of Massachusetts, a uh, suburb of Boston, uh, Needham, Massachusetts, and I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. It was uh, a predominantly white suburb, uh, relatively, you know, middle to middle class, to upper middle class. Uh, it was a pretty broad spectrum of, of um, incomes and uh, but it was, you know, it was a predominantly white suburb, and uh, I grew up, um, I guess my my experience with race was probably prior through education, is known for having a pretty good uh, education system, and it's, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on history, so we learned all the things that you typically learn about uh, the civil rights era, the Civil War, uh, you know, all of the kind of touch points in our nation's history where race is a, you know, is a factor. And in fact, that's probably every, every part of our history. So I, you know, we, we got a, I got a good uh, education. Um, of course, as, as we all know, uh, there's a lot of things that are not taught in our public schools. Yeah. So, um, uh, but but I did I did have some friends, some black friends in school. Um, so my experience was, you know, really primarily again through education and through popular culture, and yeah. and um, yeah. So I didn't. I would say it wasn't really until I went to college where my world really started expanding. And at that point, as as somebody who was interested in music, I was I was always I always loved the blues. I started uh, learning about jazz, and when I was you know, I guess in high school, and it wasn't something that you know my family was really involved in. It just happened. That there were, you know, I had my Jimi Hendrix records and my B.B. King records, and that was the stuff that I just really loved. And I, my parents listened to TBS, and we listened to all kinds of music. And um, so I did, I did get some influence from what they, what they did and what they listened to. Um, and so when I got to college, uh, my first year, I, I went to a school in Ohio, Hiram College. And uh, it wasn't really went until I transferred in my uh, sophomore year to U- to UMass University of Massachusetts Amherst, where you know I think my world really started expanding. And uh, so, so yeah, that. Was, go ahead. Well, my brother did have some records. My he had some Coltrane records, and um, I think it was just something that I just understood. And as soon as I heard that kind of music, you know, just something I immediately identified with. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't like you know I was being taken out to blues clubs or anything like that. I just, I, I just. Um, I just I just love the music and I you know my my older brother who is a musician himself and plays all kinds of music will tell me that when I was a really little kid I used to go around the house saying you know solid jazz and stuff like that so <laughs> I picked up on the stuff that I heard sometimes I would watch it on TV you know uh, my heart, I, I just uh, that that was just me I just uh, soaked it up and as a matter of fact. When I was transferring to Mass, I looked through the course catalog and I saw the American American Music Ensemble. And I I had been playing the trumpet for a little while, and I had done some singing, but I hadn't really done a whole lot of you know singing. So, but that I just looked at that and I said that is something I want to get involved in. I don't know what whatever it's going to take. That I want to be in that group, and in, in fact, that's what happened. So, so. Um, and UMass Amherst has a really rich uh, tradition and history 
of African American education and culture and music. And uh, there, you know, there there are so many musicians that taught there, and uh, Max Roach, um, uh, Yusef Latif. So it was just a great place to be. It was a really, really great time to be there as well. Yes. Well, when I was uh, in elementary school and uh, middle school, um, I was called names. I mean, I was sort of singled out. Different. And, um, you know, there were some reasons for that, I imagine. Um, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really get the sort of the macho mold of uh, other kids, uh, other boys, especially. Um, but I uh, the N word, and that that was you know that was something I wasn't prepared for. And it, it had to do they they used they, it would had to do um and you know this is just something I was called lips or angel lips if you will, and that was it was it was just something that I found really to be strange and I had to kind of figure out. You know, first of all, it was it was an insult, and it was it made me feel you know very uncomfortable, and it made me feel singled out, and I that was probably my first uh, experience of being singled out for an aspect of my appearance. I was also, and I am, hearing impaired. Um, but at the time, I didn't wear hearing aids. You know, that was before I got those, and so I was really. Um, I think that was something that I sort of. Uh, Formed my experience of that uh, this sort of mainstream world I'm in is not the only world there is, or it's there's something a little bit off, and I had to figure out the time here and, and get to the bottom of this and see where I fit in. Um, and and so you know, and then of course as I started, I mean, I when I when I got to college, I. I studied um, literature of the Harlem Renaissance, and I studied, you know, jazz and other kinds of African American music. And you know, I got a, I got a pretty good education there as well, and started to, to you know, really have my eyes opened. And so that helped me kind of look back on that experience and see it, you know, as, as is you know interesting and strange, and maybe helping to form my my identity a little more. Okay, so I want to make sure that um, I'm coming across to everyone. But so part of the experience that you had, you, know, you had mentioned that you were hearing impaired. You had mentioned that uh, people made fun of you because of your 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 physical appearance. So. You know, I got to ask because the listeners are probably wondering what what part of your physical appearance, um, you know, warranted you getting called the um, N word. Well, it was my lips. Okay. And apparently, perhaps, maybe they were, you know, they were large in proportion to my face. I don't know. It was just something that, you know, I mean. When you are the way you are, and you're born that way, and you can't change it, right? I mean, you know, people start singling you out for something. Your first thought is, you know, you know, after trying to purse your lips. I mean, my my wife tells me she used to pinch, try to pinch her nose up. You know that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But you know, I would try to figure out: can I purse my lips? Can I, you know? And of course, after like an hour of trying to do that, you realize. <laughs> It's not something I can change. So, right. Uh, and, I, you know, so you try to change the way that you react to the way somebody is, is treating you. And and uh, that can have all kinds of consequences, like getting beaten up and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. So... Um... so I know a little about your history because obviously I know you since, you know, we uh, attended the same 
church in Austin. And so I also know that you're um, currently married to an African-American person. So how did that all happen? Sure. Well, uh, so after college, I was out working, uh, doing various different things. I got an opportunity to become an assistant teacher. So I was working in a school in Boston, uh, and it was um, it was a well, it was pri- yeah, it was the a school that has a multidisciplinary uh, set of programs, and one of them was this vocational program that I was working in, and I was I had cafeteria duty, and my wife uh, had cafeteria duty as well. She's a nurse, and she was working there for uh, sort of taking some time out from her from her nursing and okay. working as a health educator in the school. So we were, we both sort of got put there and um, she'll tell me that, um, you know, her mother who passed away when she was, when she was young, when she was in college, she says her mother put us together. You know? So <laughs> that, I, to me, that is, that, that I think there's a, that's gotta be true. So, uh, because it's the best thing that happened to me, certainly. But uh, we, we got to know each other. We, you know, we had cafeteria duty together where we had to stand there and tell kids, sit down, wait till you hear the bell, take your hat off, turn off the radio. That's back when kids had, you know, boom boxes. Right. So they, you know, we had to tell them to turn the radio off, sit down, wait till you, you know, you hear the bell before lunch is over. And we, you know, we were sort of there. We bonded together and, you know, I fell in love and we so that's how we... So... Uh, yeah, look, Colties, and that could all be the fault of the host here. Um, so hopefully Brian will call back in. And um, this is this is a good time for me to announce that you're listening to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. nervous about doing this call but now like you know now i really want to get my story out there like no you're not going to stop me i know i know (laughs) just trying to double check and make sure that everything is moving the way it should be moving so brian i do apologize um i know you're like right in the middle of getting ready to get your story out and it's a good story so (laughs) (laughs) it's nothing personal here but it's no yeah so um, okay, so share with us, um, you know, what decisions did you and your wife make as far as when you, you know, were having children and, and your daughter got to be older, what, what kind of stories, if any, did you talk to her about as far as race? Well, the first, the first interesting thing is that our daughter is adopted. Okay. And we went for a few years, we adopted her at birth and she is, um, mixed race, just like us. And so we went for a a few years struggling with the question about how do we tell her she's adopted. So that was sort of like the first order of business. And, you know, we were really apprehensive about that. We read books. We consulted with people. And one of our best friends said, look, you you know, it's just don't make a big deal about it. Just tell her. And if you're not going to tell her, I will. (laughs) Of course, (laughs) that was, you know... And, and I had no no doubt that he would do that. So um, I know he was sort of half joking, but so you know we we uh, we had that conversation and that went really well. And so, but we we have talked with her about her her history, and um, we haven't really you know said look we're going to sit down and have the talk about right how you need to act and. And, uh, you know, that, quote, unquote, the talk. Right. And I think, she, you know, that we may really need to do that, too. Um, but she's, she's a very uh, confident and strong person. And, and so it's, it's sort of a continuing conversation. I, I feel like she's got a really good sense of self and... Um, I'm not really at all (laughs) worried about her feeling confused about, you know, 
being uh, from, you know, mixed parentage. And I I just feel like she's got a really great future. Good. And so, and th- you know, this is, I mean, it's, it's easier now. It's, um, mixed race families or mixed families, blended families are all over the place. And, you know, on TV and at school and at church. So, right. so I think it's, I think it's, I, I hope it's easier for her now than, you know, maybe it was uh, in, in decades past. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, Austin is a little different um, when yeah. it comes to that. But um, I'm sure if there's anything going on, she will definitely she'll definitely let you know about it. Um the other part that I just wanted to touch base on, um, if you can share with us, I know you participated in the One Human Race series um, there in Austin. So can you share with us what that experience was like um, for you and um, what insights did you gain from that, if any? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I gained a lot. I gained a tremendous amount. It was a great experience. And really good time. Uh, I had somebody join St. James, and it, I, I, you know, I knew about the church's history as being by students at Houston Tilton, um, black students, how to attend uh, an Episcopal church in town. So, uh, but then going on to make the church included, you know, the, the very sorts of people that might uh, they might have thought were discriminating against them, therefore making a really inclusive, welcoming church. Oh, yeah, so, not uh, not so much the church, but that, actually, the, yeah, the that was sort of the yeah that's the context for. I, I guess I just wanted to talk about that because that's how I came to learn about one human. Race. Oh, okay, and you know the, the the funny thing is about a year before. I found about out about one human race, and the title of it was refuting race. And I had this really sort of naive idea that I was going to write this book about um, you know the concept or the myth of race from a you know I was going to cite scientific uh, literature you know or science and philosophy and you know sort of put out the idea that race was just a construct and it wasn't it wasn't a real scientific fact. But I have a lot of in that other than of uh, you know where I had come from and what I understood, uh, I I had I knew that that was the truth, but I didn't really have the 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 history or the research at my fingertips. And I didn't get very much farther than writing the introduction to the book. <laughs> but and, you know, along came one human race, and it uh, it didn't just affirm my understanding; it really expanded on it, and it did it of a group of people where we could talk freely. And uh, I, I learned a tremendous amount from watching the BS series, uh, the um, race, the power um, of an illusion, yeah, of, race, exactly. the power, illusion, right? right. And, I, I mean. There's, there's always so much to learn, and there's so much of a need for scholarship and understanding and learning about our history. There's so much more, even if the schools could teach a lot more, even if there were any political agendas to, you know, to restrict, <laughs> where, you know, we, um, or, you know, a cultural lens to sort of uh, limit you know, what you find out. There's always so much more to learn, and this this was a really tremendous experience. Okay. I learned a lot from from the program. I learned a lot from the discussion, and it was a, it was a great opportunity to, to connect with other people. Great. So and, uh, I'm, I'm taking a and look to at, help serve people as well. Yeah, yeah. and the, and I think that's what really um, is the driving initiative behind the One Human Nation um, radio show is that. If we can just all feel comfortable um, in telling our stories, we'll find that we have a lot more in common than what we mm-hmm. have different. But we we yeah. are just entrenched in what we see and what we hear. And um, 
we all have um, some bias in some form or the other, and it, it can be harmful and painful when it's an unconscious bias. Um, and it's about having the ability to go through a process where we can get through reconciliation, where we can get through healing, so we can get to justice. So I do um, appreciate you sharing your time today, and I do apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, as as we wrap up with you, Brian, um, it, are there any additional thoughts you want to share? Well, it was a real joy to be talking with you today and to be able to tell a little bit of my story. And I, I, again, I just really enjoyed connecting with you through One Human Race. Um, I think that it's the kind of program that this, this country needs a lot more of. And this, uh, you know, you're doing this radio show is just an extension of that. And whenever you can connect with somebody and do it on the basis of mutual understanding right. and the idea that nobody is a subject matter expert. Everyone has something to learn and share, and uh, we can go forward helping each other and connecting and finding out how we're re really all the same. There, right. there is one human race. One human race, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. It's, it's great. So I you know, really enjoyed this opportunity. Well, thank you, and, um, you know, I hate saying goodbye, so I'll just say un until we meet again. That's right, yeah. Okay, take care, Brian. Yeah. You too, Sandy. And we're back with One Human Nation, and um, I could hear Brian, I guess his, his dog was also letting us know that it was time for us to end the conversation. I do want to share with you that if you are um, a business, if you enjoy our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. Let your customers, neighbors, and friends know that you share our vision of building a thriving community based on diverse, vibrant radio programming. As a business partner, our listeners will know you support Savannah's only broad-based community radio station. Become a tower sponsor or underwriter to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship. And to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash corporate. Again, to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash corporate. Thank you for listening and to supporting WRUULP. And for those that are listening and you may have um, um, or, you know, people that are trying to listen and they're having difficulties, let them know that they can stream also by going to WRUU.org and just, um, you know, click on the icon that has a little microphone there and you'll be able to stream the show also. So our, our guest today talked about, um, you know, not really being aware of differences until, you know, much later in college um, and that it really, you know, it, it was it's, it's also about how we self-identify. And um, unfortunately, people make assumptions about us by our appearances and how we look and the assumptions um, about, you know, our physical features, whether it's our nose, whether it's our lips, you know, and it's definitely connected with our skin tone and, um, you know, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And as I mentioned before, I do plan on completing and I encourage you to complete the implicit association test um, as it relates to race, um, black and white, but they also have an implicit association test as it relates to skin tone and what's considered to be um, an acceptable skin tone um, uh, and lighter as opposed to darker. 
you can share your story and the best way to do that and again we don't put anybody on the spot but you can email me if you have an interest in sharing your story and we can talk about it before you actually go on the radio station uh, on the radio show and you can email me at my story at one my story at onehumannation.info. I do encourage you to go to the One Human Nation website, and that's where you can click on um, the Implicit Association test. That's where you can also watch the clips from some portions of the PBS series Race, the, Empower, the Power of an Illusion, um, as well as a, another documentary that talks about our um, our prison system. I do encourage you to continue on your journey. I hope you will tune in next week as we continue talking about race and our concepts of race, our unconscious bias, and what we can do to make a difference in our community. I know it can seem overwhelming with everything that we hear about um, and what continues to be uh, demonstrated in our culture, um, demonstrated whether it's in our cities or in our state. It's definitely demonstrated in our country that we still have a long way to go to get through a reconciliation um, about race and um, to go through a healing process. And um, I've been encouraged by one of the, the states that really has taken a, an aggressive role in taking down um, statues and making it very clear that, um, you know, the viewpoint of a historian thinking that um, the Confederacy is not involved or it's just history and it's not a painful part of our history. Um, I think that's just part of the process. I think that's it's not about trying to erase the history. It's not about trying to um, create a, a new history. Uh, it's about looking at the painful reality of our history. And it is our history. It's not it's not a black history or a white history. It is um it's not only a Native American history or an Asian American history, it's our history. And until we actually um, take ownership of our history, we're going to continue to have the struggles that we are currently experiencing in this country. And some of it's just denial um, of not really wanting to take a look at um, what we can do or what needs to change so we can move towards um, justice more towards equality and that's that's not to have an excuse for on one side of the fence or the other it's about embracing our history and what do we need to do to take the next steps you're listening to WRUULP Savannah Georgia 107.5 FM WRUU.org we are Savannah Soundings community radio with global soul as we prepare for next week, I do want to prompt you to continue listening to the next host that's coming up, which will be Troy Stoner with Sound Limits. Troy Stoner with Sound Limits will be coming up at 6 o'clock. So thanks for listening to OneHumanNation.info. Please visit our website at www.OneHumanNation.info. Thank you.